Amen. Amen. Man, I just enjoy worshiping with our church family. I, uh, I'm glad that you're here this morning, and uh, I hope that you are ready to uh, hear the Word, uh, to get uh, fed spiritually. Um, you know, this, this past week, we've, uh, the last few weeks, we've been raising some, an offering uh, for another water well in Kenya. And um, we passed our goal this week. And uh, what, a, what a blessing that is. So thank you. Thank you for those of you who gave and are willing to uh, see that others may have fresh water. Uh, we take a lot for granted when we can go over to the spigot and turn the water and it, and it flows out as much as we want. You know, this morning, um, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, and uh, I've entitled this sermon, Our Choice Concerning Commitment, and um, really this is a beautiful passage, and I'm, I'm excited about this passage. Um, you know, when we think about, we're going to read it in just a moment, but um, you think about money in the bank, okay? Think about that for just a moment, money in the bank. I mean, that phrase, it has such a nice safe, secure sound, doesn't it? Money in the bank. I mean, money in the bank as opposed to money under your mattress seems to be a little bit safer, doesn't it? You know? Money in the bank seems like it's safe and secure, that somebody can't just walk up and find it and take it. Well, okay, maybe they can. But money in the bank as opposed to not having money at all Money in the bank is better. If you have money in the bank, then you know that you're going to be all right. But if you don't have money in the bank, then you're probably worried. You look at those numbers on your bank app and you realize what your month is going to look like because maybe there's no money in the bank. But money in the bank tells you that you're going to be okay. When you have money in the bank, you feel like, okay, I can handle this. Things are good. But money in the bank, as opposed to just the promise of money, like an IOU or a contract that says you're going to get paid someday, money in the bank seems to be a lot better. You might even have a sure thing, but it really isn't sure until the check clears And then it becomes money in the bank. See, money in the bank means that we've got it for sure. It's definitely ours. Unless, of course, the bank fails. But pastor, we have the FDIC. We have the insurance by the federal government so that it guarantees that our banks won't ever fail. So our money in the bank is safe. That is, unless, of course, the government fails. The federal government. Oh, but that could never happen. And then something comes along like the attack on the World Trade Center. (laughs) 9-11. Hundreds and thousands of people lost their lives in that single event. And it rocked our economy all the way to the core. Our government didn't go under. But what if another catastrophe? What if a hurricane or a natural disaster or or some other type of calamity? Maybe an earthquake or another attack stacked on top of that. Just how much could the government bear? See, at some point, it would run out of money. (laughs) Some people think it already has. But then, all the government could do is spend money and promise to pay it back in the future. And that promise is only as stable as the one who makes the promise, the federal government. Nothing against America. Greatest country in the world. I love it. But just how stable is that when we talk about money in the bank? 
See, money in the bank isn't sounding nearly as safe and secure as it used to. It doesn't seem certain at all. But I want you to understand something. That is exactly what the Bible says about money. Whether it's in the bank, whether it's in your, under your mattress or in your wallet or in your dreams, money can't be trusted. Today we're going to talk about treasure. Not just money in the bank, but the treasure each of us possesses. And we all have some. That reminds me of a mother who was hysterical because little Jimmy had swallowed a quarter. Went down his throat and she wasn't sure what she was going to do about it. So she told her husband to call the doctor to find out what to do about it. And instead of calling the doctor, her husband dialed the pastor's number. She said, why are you calling the pastor? He said, my pastor can get money out of anyone. See, I want to put you at ease. My goal is not to try and pry money out of you this morning. You can sigh a big sigh of relief. The offering has already been taken. You need to know something, too. Although we are a little behind for the year, we're still in good shape going into this last quarter of the year financially as a church. You need to know something else. We're also out of debt. We've, we're not carrying any debt with us. So this is a beautiful thing. So I'm not going to try and take up another offering or that kind of thing. But we're talking about money today because Jesus talked about money. And as we work our way through the Sermon on the Mount, um, somewhat wounded because of the conviction that comes as we read the Sermon on the Mount. Um, We come to this passage this morning in Matthew 6, verse 19 and following. Jesus said it this way. He said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Loving Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your instruction. I ask, Holy Spirit, that this morning, in in this moment, that you would... Show us that you would guide us, that you would be our teacher, that you would lead us into all truth. Lord, we thank you for all that you are doing, and we pray that you would guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. See, the big question in the Sermon on the Mount is the question of where my heart is, where your heart is, what are, we, what are we focused on? Lately, my heart has been challenged to really think about this question and to evaluate if my heart is seeking after self or if it is really seeking after a relationship, a vibrant relationship with God. Because as we read the Sermon on the Mount, we're challenged by these things. And in this passage, Jesus directly addresses the heart issue by asking Where's your treasure? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Not should be, not might be, but where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Very important. See, there's a lot of things that are vying for our hearts. 
since it's the control center of our life. Because it's the sweet spot. It's the spot that God made for himself. Probably no area of existence demands daily choice for the believer, for the Christian, more than the area of materialism. When we talk about materialism, okay, as Christians, we're turned off by the non-Christians and the way they, they have all their idols and their superstitions and their pagan practices. But did it ever occur to you that a Christian could be an idolater? See, idolatry takes various forms. And in America, in America, many Christians worship at the feet of materialism. See, the Bible says in Colossians 3, 5, it says, And covetousness, which is idolatry, greed, after things, wanting more and more. Never satisfied, not having enough, not being content, wanting more and more and consuming it on our lusts. See, greed after things is idolatry. Worldly ambition represents a powerful fascination. Jesus helped his followers by talking about them. And he talked about it in, in the, the light of the choice between masters the choice of the master or the choice of materialism. That's the choice we have between those two. See, materialism is so subtle that it's crept into the thinking of almost all Christians in America. And as Christians, we know that there is nothing that should come between us and our relationship with God. We know that. But how we respond and how we act are different from what we know. But how often do we, as I want to say this, as the wealthiest Christians in the world, how often do we let our possessions, our pursuits, our pleasures, become our idols. See, it's on this problem of materialism that the Lord will speak to us today. We may say, well, Brother Ridge, you're plowing close to the corn this morning. You're right. It's convicting. It's convicting for all of us. See, maybe some of you are smugly saying, well, I can tune out because <laughs> I don't have much of the way of this world's goods. Pastor's talking to the rich people. But you need to understand something. Even poor people are not free from the idolatry of materialism. See, your idols may not be what you have, but it may be what you do not have and want. Covetousness is idolatry, and God hates idolatry. So in this passage, Jesus presents the choices. He gives us the choices, and Jesus began his discussion with the, the, the presentation of two alternatives. Treasure in heaven or treasure on earth. Verses 19 and 20. On the one hand, Jesus warned about the treasures on earth. However, he did not prevent his followers from saving money. When Jesus spoke about storing treasures up for yourselves, he warned about being possessed by your possessions. The more you have, the more you're going to worry about it. Being possessed by your possessions. See, if earthly treasure, if our treasure is on earthly things, and it's kept in earthly treasuries, then the longings of our heart will never rise higher than the earth. 
That's why he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If our treasure is here below, then that's where we're going to focus. If our treasure is above, then that's where we will focus. Here's the deal. Everything we own, everything we have ever bought, it all crumbles toward chaos. This principle is so well known that scientists have a law of thermodynamics to describe it. It's called entropy. Everything in the universe moves towards disorder. And we've all seen entropy at work. I mean, a car, a new car is always better, it's always shinier, it's always brighter, it's always faster, it's more efficient, it's nicer smelling when you first get it, right? I mean, after just a little time, I mean, does your car get cleaner? Does it get shinier? Does it get smelling better? No. As soon as you drive it off the lot, you've lost some of the value of that car. See, already your deposit in the World Bank has started to disappear. You know, when your kids play with your computer or they fiddle around with your stereo or they borrow, borrow your tools. You know, do they unintentionally fix them? You know, uh, oops, Dad, I'm sorry, I I was using your uh, thing And I accidentally improved it. It's actually better now than before I borrowed it. Is that how it happens at your house? Because that's not how it happens at my house. Usually I find it broken. You know, the deposits in the World Bank tend to disappear. I mean, every homeowner knows that. You buy the home and suddenly it takes time and money and attention Just to keep the four walls up, it seems. That's entropy. So Jesus says, stop making deposits in the world bank. And if your treasure, if our treasure is of spiritual things and is kept in heaven's bank, then our hearts will be in heaven even though we ourselves are still walking upon the earth. See, Jesus spoke about the treasure in heaven. And the treasure in heaven are those people who have been won to Jesus Christ. The treasures in heaven are those kindnesses and those things that we've done for others. Other works that we do for our Lord. See, to become a committed Christian, we must choose to invest in our treasures in heaven And not so much here on the earth. Jesus goes on to examine the security. Because any time a person faces a choice on a matter. The element of security should be considered. Our treasures on earth are so, so insecure. I mean in Jesus' day. Materialism was represented primarily in three areas. One was clothing, one was food, and one was in gold or silver. And Jesus depicted how insecure the treasures of the earth are. I mean, moths can ruin clothing, food can rot or be eaten by animals or whatever, and, and the gold and silver can be stolen by someone, by intruders. But after considering the insecurity of our treasures on earth, listen to how Jesus' statements about the security in heaven that he makes here in verse 20. He says this, he says, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. That's pretty secure. He's dealt with all three of those right out of the chute. And then Jesus focuses our values. Jesus elaborated on the idea of how a person puts possessions where his or her heart is. 
Listen, the way a Christian, the way a believer spends their money shows the spiritual condition of their heart. Jesus moves from the demonstration of a person's values by possessions to the illustration of a single eye, the clear eye, and the the single service. Verse 22 and 23 says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If then, so then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. What a statement! What a statement. See, the clear eye means a healthy eye. To be able to see. And the evil eye represents a bad eye, a diseased eye, if you will. And the clear eye brings proper vision so that we are able to see. And the bad eye affects the whole personality. You know, Jesus insisted that we keep the spiritual eye clear. The values clear and undistorted. So that we might be able to see and do God's will. Not what someone else says. Not the philosophy of the world. Not the deception of our culture and society. But so that we might see and do the will of God. We are so ready to listen to others rather than to hear what our Savior is saying. Think about spiritual blindness. I mean, the Pharisees had this problem because their spiritual eyes were diseased. They wanted to give deference. They wanted to give preference. They wanted to show favoritism to the rich person, thinking that somehow they might receive some of that. They were spiritually blind. Now an eyeball in and of itself cannot be bad morally. However, the eye is the organ of perception through which our whole personality is guided. When you think about the way the eye works, we see and we take in the things of our world around us through our eyes. And if we're looking at things wrongly, could be our eyes. It could be our perspective. It could be the lenses by which we see the world. See, if we focus our vision on what the world calls success, our perception will be distorted. And the light of God's revelation of reality will be blocked out. The whole personality will be darkened. So I ask you this morning... What are you looking at? What are you focusing on? What do you see? Because a lot of times we're focused on the wrong things. We're looking at the wrong things. Are the things that you are looking at, are the things out there in front of you, are they temporal? Are they temporary? Or are they eternal? As brothers and sisters, it makes a difference in how you live your life as to what you see before you. Finally, Jesus states the impossibility. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. He's not saying it's not wise. What he's saying is it's an impossibility. You're going to love one and you're going to despise the other. He gave us this picture of a slave and a slave owner. No one can serve two masters. Listen, two masters rarely shared servants but when they did there would always be a divided interest remember this that 
in Jesus' day, about half of the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. Half of the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. And you know what? There were no part-time slaves. None. And I would submit to you this morning that there are no part-time Christians. Either he is our Lord and Master or we've made something else our Lord and Master. You can't look in two directions at the same time. A slave cannot serve two masters. And you can't live for both God and money. That word mammon, verse 24, the NASB translates it wealth. Mammon was derived from the Hebrew word which meant to be entrusted or to be certain And so originally it meant to entrust. Mammon was to entrust something to someone. And mammon speaks of the kind of earthly riches or property that we lay up as a security for our future by entrusting it to another. It referred to when someone entrusted to someone else to keep for a time, then it would be available when it would be needed. Something along the lines of what Social security is supposed to be. Something entrusted for a later date to someone who will return it back to us. Now we who are familiar with the Bible are accustomed to thinking of the word mammon negatively. It's a negative way, but it's not originally, it was not understood negatively. In fact, an ancient rabbi once used the word mammon when he wrote this. He said, let the property, that which is mammon, of thy fellow, of your friend, be dear to thee as thine own. In other words, it wasn't a negative thing. But in time, the meaning of the word changed from the positive idea, that which is entrusted, to the negative idea of that in which a man puts his trust. And specifically, it came to mean the wealth or property in which one placed one's trust for the future. And it came to be something that someone allowed to take the primary place in their life. A place that should only be occupied by God himself. So when he says no man can serve two masters... You cannot serve God and mammon, that thing that has taken first place in your life. See, anyone who divides allegiance between God and mammon has already given commitment to mammon. God can only be served with an entire and exclusive devotion. See, every one of us is confronted by this commitment. Every one of us. Commitment represents one of the key experiences of the Christian. As we give our life to Christ, as we say, Lord, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I accept your sacrifice. We make a commitment to him to be his witnesses. We make a commitment to him That he is our Lord and Savior. He is our master. And we become his disciple. It's not a one time happening. Commitment should come every day. I'm glad that my wife commits herself to me every day. Not just 33 years ago. But every day. The same type of commitment our Lord expects of us. A commitment every day. You see, people choose whether to be committed to Christ or to materialism. And oddly enough, some people choose mammon. 
Some people choose that. Others choose Christ. And they enjoy the thrill and the relevancy of being committed, a committed follower of Jesus Christ. See, many people struggle their whole lives for material things. Only to discover too late that with money they can buy a beautiful house. But they can't buy a home. With money, they can buy a beauty rest mattress, but they cannot buy sleep. They can buy food, but not an appetite. They can buy medicine, but not health. And if they turn to religion, they can buy a church, but not heaven. They can buy a crucifix, but they cannot buy a savior. See, if you are here without Christ this morning, I want you to know that salvation is not in things. Spiritual peace is not in earthly comforts. Happiness is not in money. And heaven is not in materialism. Salvation, your salvation and my salvation which results in peace, which results in joy, which results in heaven, is only found in Jesus Christ. And that's why many of us are here today, is because we believe that with all our heart. See, I can't make it any plainer. You will never be satisfied with life until you make a commitment to Jesus Christ, making him your Lord and Savior and allowing him to be your all in all. You can chase after this, you can chase after that. You're not gonna find it. I'm telling you now, this is where it's found. It's found in Jesus Christ. My prayer is that you would make that commitment today. Let's pray.